Well, I recently read the autobiography of George Mueller. Mueller was an evangelist in England in the late 1800s. And one of the things that he is most well known for is establishing and managing orphanages and schools. It's been noted that he cared for over uh, 10,000 orphans and educated probably about 120 children in his lifetime. So he just did amazing work. But perhaps one of the most unique things about Mueller that he's known for is for the way he handled matters of concern, primarily financial, believing that God would provide and casting all of his hope upon the verse, uh, ask and it shall be given to you. Mueller would not speak about what he needed or what the orphanage needed. He would simply pray, believing that God would provide. And so his autobiography is filled with these types of stories about facing a winter with no heat and all of a sudden a new boiler being provided, facing a lack of food in the orphanage and all of a sudden a truckload of food being donated, facing a lack of funds and donations coming pouring in. Mueller's autobiography is seen as a testimony to the reality of the power of prayer and the providence of God to take care of God's people. I would very much like to be a George Mueller. Not in the sense of leaving things in the hands of God. You know, I try to do that as much as I possibly can, and I hope that you do too. Nothing drives you to just giving it into God's hand more than a building project. No, I would like to be like George Mueller and simply keep things privatized. And simply go on with our work and ministry and never have to talk about needs. I can't do that, however. So on this Holy Cross Sunday, we need to turn an eye on ourselves. And we need to think about some matters, some matters that we need to face together as we move forward into the future that God holds out to us. Now, I do know that there's some visitors here today, and so I apologize that this is a little bit more of an in-house sermon than we normally do, Um, but a community of faith every once in a while needs to check in and kind of see what we're doing and see how we're doing. So that's what we're doing today. To begin, I want everybody to know that I am incredibly enthusiastic. I am excited about what God will do in this place and about the future that God is holding out to us. Now, this is largely unknown. I don't know what God will do in the next coming years. I anticipate that it will be times of growth, that it will be a time of kind of deep experiences of God's provision for us. I anticipate that there will be a movement of, of grounding us in and creating us just as a community of prayerfulness, Uh, these thoughts, these possibilities, they electrify me. I can't wait. I so enjoy being in this place. I stand in the multi-purpose room, or I stand in the narthex looking at the ascension window, and I feel a profound sense of hope for our life together. And I hope that you feel that too. I was talking to somebody after the 8 o'clock service, and I said, you know, in some sense, it's undescribable. It just, it feels good. It feels right. Somebody commented and said, yeah, it feels holy. I hope that when you walk through the glass doors, that you are confronted with the spirit of hope and grace that permeates this place. I hope that you feel God's spirit in tangible ways as God is moving here. We are challenged uh, to keep that hope as we move forward and to face challenges that await us. And there are challenges. And just like George Mueller, some of those are financial. Now the congregation had asked every once in a while for an update on where we are, particularly with the building project. We are now at the point of knowing a pretty good ballpark of where we will end up at the end of our construction. Currently, we have $151,000 left, approximately, 
in our building fund. Uh, we just received a bill associated for the extra costs that we have occurred over this project. The amount of that bill is $186,000. And we will also have some final bills to pay to the architect and to the construction company. You can do the math. Now, I should say, we have just received a donation, although I don't know how much that is. Uh, and that $186,000 number will probably go down based on things that we are not responsible for or credits that we are owed. Also, in speaking with Tanya, who is kind of heading up the, the fundraising, uh, she let me know that there's about $30,000 left in pledges to be received over the next, I think, year and a half. And so you get the general idea that we are close but not all there. But we can't really get ahead of ourselves. Because this isn't just about saying, okay, let's dig deep, let's raise another $50,000 and we'll be okay. Remember, our financial plan for this project included $300,000 of loans. $200,000 from the diocese, which they gave us in support for this project and this community and $100,000 to the Anglican Foundation. And these loans need to be paid back. And so our monthly revenue will need to reflect these payments. Current projections see us running about $25,000 behind where we want to be. Now some of this makes sense. It's been a hard year. For most of the year, uh, we were without a front door. Let's be clear about that. And that has drastic effect, particularly on some of our big occasions like Christmas and Easter. Our services were smaller than anticipated. And because we had no front door and we were going through the back way down a flight of stairs and up a flight of stairs, because of accessibility restrictions and the dust that was here, our numbers, our weekly numbers, went down. You know, some who, were, who are or were regular faithful attendants, because of the dust or the accessibility issues, weren't able to come as regularly as they would like. Obviously, there is a hope that these people that we didn't see regularly over construction would now become regular again now that we are done. Uh, I had to laugh because a little while ago, I did something that I never thought I would ever do. I used a bowling analogy. You know, you know Solomon is taking, is a part of a bowling league. Uh, Colin, Eric, Eric's wife, Alicia, Glenn, they're his bowling coaches. And I know Eric has completely been taunting me about becoming a bowling parent, something that I have vehemently resisted for the past two years. But I think I have to cave in once I actually made a bowling analogy. But uh, when children learn how to bowl, they learn how to bowl two-handed. And generally, that's through their legs. And you can actually do quite well. But there's always going to be a ceiling. There's always going to be kind of a top score or a top average that you're going to hit, and you're never going to progress beyond it. What needs to happen in order to fully grow into your potential is that children need to stop bowling two-handed and learn how to bowl one-handed, as the professionals do. But as they learn how to do that, what happens? Their scores 